It bore down on the floor into a pouncing position and produced sounds like it was revving up servos and charging pistons. I already knew it was going to charge at me with a full speed sprint, closing the distance in seconds. I turned and ran, doing my best to endure the pain in my legs. I saw a chance up ahead, probably my only one. There was a fire axe on the wall mounted case. Not far past that, another small box and my only hope of survival. A couple seconds later, I started dragging my aching legs down the hall, rapidly heavy thuds behind me following. It was closing in. Having no idea how any of the creature's physics worked, I grabbed onto the tall metal shelf and pulled it down as I ran. I looked back to see that I'd hit another wall, which kept it from toppling completely over. The heavy-duty shelf rested at an angle, and it should slow the hunter, if only for a moment as long as it didn't simply pass right through it like a ghost. Not that I could explain away why, but the shelf really did stop it in its tracks. It couldn't squeeze through, below, or above it, so it began to slice into it instead. Each impact of its claws tore the metal into ribbons, and it took maybe four or five seconds for it to weaken the shelf enough for it to be able to snap it in half with a bite of its teeth. It knocked the two destroyed halves to the side, thrashed its way through what remained, and began to pick up the speed again. I hadn't delayed it for long, but maybe it was enough. I stopped at the fire hex box, bashed into the glass with my bare fist and cut open my hand in the process, yanked out the potential weapon. A part of me wanted to slam it into the beast's face as revenge, even if it wouldn't likely cut into its stainless steel armor. This wouldn't be the kind of monster story where it actually got destroyed at the end. I didn't have the kind of firepower, only a fire axe, hardly a defense at all. It was the fuse box that would be running by that gave me a chance. My goal was obvious. Risk electrocution by planting the axe's blade firmly into it, hopefully shutting off the lights. I twisted around as I reached him. The hunter had just scrunched down its body, preparing to jump. With all the strength I could muster, which was never as much as I wanted, I swung about my right arm and the axe had held like a whip. The blade punctured right through the box's cover and planted itself deep into the circuitry. It shut out sparks and for a brief moment the lights flickered and the creature's existence ran along with it. It took to the air, its jaws open, ready to take my head clean off. I closed my eyes and accepted that, if anything, this introverted tech nerd had tried his damn hardest. And then I opened my eyes to the darkness of the corridor, right as the dim emergency lights flipped on. There was a shadow on my right, vaguely in the shape of the monster's gaping maw, giving me my tenth or so heart attack of the night. I steadied myself, got my breathing under control, and listened to the silence of the long hallway. My dosimeter wasn't complaining anymore, either. I turned around and resumed my walk to the door at the end. On the way, I took out one of the emergency cigarettes I always have carried on me. With a trembling hand, I lit it with a match, contributing a little more natural, regular old light to the hall. It was all I had to calm my nerves bad as things were for me. The door had been broken into. The lock rested on the ground, looking like it had been pried off by the Germans. I assumed that Laszlo had put it there in an attempt to keep anyone from turning the lights on again. Just our luck that a pair of determined urban explorers decided to intrude on our tour that night. Just to be safe, I went back, retrieved the axe, went up two flights of stairs in near total darkness, then turned a corner into the top of the control room. It was smaller than I expected, and its only window really was the town hall's facade second floor middle window. It gave me a good view of the model Main Street, all the way back into the cinema's marquee at the other end. Laszlo's last words to me were accurate. This could barely qualify as a control room. The only thing I could do was pull the almost comically sized lever stuck in the metal console by the glass. I used both hands to do so. Since the thing was partially stuck or rusted and required extra force to move. Once I cut off the flow of power into the town and all the lights had shut off, I leaned in closer to the window for any signs of life. A single flashlight turned on from one of the town's alleys, its beam the only thing moving I could see in the darkness. Several seconds later, a second beam joined in. They were both alive. I'd never really saved anyone's life before. Truth be told, I didn't even know how to feel about that in the moment. It was just my dumbass motivations that got them here in the first place. As the two shambled towards the exit, I got a look around at this so-called control room. 
It had its own power, but only had a few dim wall-mounted lights that didn't give the place much illumination. Laszlo called the room fake, and I could see why. All it had was a giant lever with one function. It would easily tempt anyone into turning on lights that would end up killing them. I figured that, unless someone in charge came by here on a scheduled basis to flip the lever up and reset everything, then it eventually reset on its own to deactivate the lights. Or maybe Laszlo just kept an eye on it. This all screamed still active experiment to me. There had to be more to find in this place. I searched the room's walls, looked under its ugly yellow rug, tried to pry apart the console, checked behind a hanging painting of the sun, and then studied the walls again. The second time I did, my fingers felt a groove of some sort in the floral wallpaper. I'd found a hidden door, its outer edge running along the seam where two segments of the wall meet. I wonder if Laszlo had found it already. I used the axe like a crowbar to pry it open, revealing a tiny Cold War era bunker-like room on the other side. A grid of CCTV monitors lined the wall, but they were all covered in dust and likely burnt out. In the cabinet beneath them were VCRs, but no tapes inside the units were boxed up on the shelves. A big metal cabinet was lined with dials and dusty meters, but I had no idea what they once controlled. There was an open safe, any documents it might have held long gone. I looked through the drawers on one of the room's desks and checked the spaces between the furniture and the walls. I found nothing. I hoped for any small clue about the laser guns what this place was, or info about the optical and light technology they were researching here. But the room gave me no clues other than the fact that at some point there were cameras here to record experiments. Apparently that experiment had gone on for countless years without anyone around to watch. Flies falling into a honeypot and dropping off the face of the earth when they encountered the mechanical menace waiting for them. I wanted to burn the place to the ground and then walk away from the inferno whilst metaphorical trapped spirits were finally granted freedom and rest. But I didn't have so much as a gas can on me. Even so, I did what I could. When I left that room, I took the axe to the control room console. I think I fed the destruction with my rage. I thought it was the fear violently leaving my body back then. But now I see it as taking out my frustration about the whole mystery around secret projects of war that ended when I was a kid. That I always had thought was just about espionage. Another place, more risks taken. Still no answers. I had become just as obsessed with the Shadow World and its history as Jack, Kate, and their friend were. It was hard to let go and give up, knowing all that had happened and the lives destroyed or lost to some sinister echo reaching out from the past. I hacked away, eventually breaking the console open, and kept hitting until the big metal box was in pieces and its wires were spilt into a bundle of spaghetti. The axe blade chipped away, and my last few strikes were blunt force impacts more than anything. When a few sparks shot out, smoldered, and started a small fire in the room, I finally felt at least a little satisfied and confident that the lights would never turn on again. The wooden axe handle had also started to splinter. A couple more impacts and it would have broken in half. With my body at its physical limits, I tossed the axe away and dragged myself down the hallway, just as Jack was passing by with Laszlo on his arm. Our guide was in bad shape, but Jack had just managed to create a tourniquet and slow his bleeding. We finally got out of the warehouse sometime around three in the morning, and once we had phone signal again, we called the village doctor and got him to open up the clinic for a late night visit. He fixed me up a bit and stabilized Lazo's condition, though he'd have to go to the nearest town for proper treatment. Jack offered to drive, and by sunrise we had arrived at the proper hospital. It wasn't until me and Jack were seated together in the otherwise empty waiting room at the seven in the morning, eating breakfast hash did we finally have time to really catch our breaths and think about what had just happened. I don't even really remember what we talked about, though. I'm sure it wasn't important, as we were just grateful to be alive, while also sharing our disbelief about all that had just happened.
The big question was if any of it was worth it. When Laszlo was discharged, we brought him back home. He seemed to be in high spirits, considering. Missing a hand and half an arm barely faced the guy. He was going to use some of the cash he got from raiding the warehouse to buy a badass prosthetic. Then he thanked us for saving his life, of course. Me and Jack spent the next day cooped up in our hostel, resting and trying to get our heads back on straight. The next day, Laszlo wanted to meet us one last time before we started heading home. He led us up to a wall safe in his small yet eclectic house, loaded with enough tech and pop culture artifacts to make even me jealous. It turned out he had actually lied to us about something else earlier. He really did have some knowledge about certain things and found a few relics on his scavenging hunts. But we understood his own need for secrecy. He knew he either needed to keep his findings to himself for all time or pass them on to someone he could fully trust. He didn't want his discoveries to be traced back to him and get himself tracked down. In a file folder were the following. Research papers on light and laser technology. Schedules for urban combat training in the town. A list of radio frequencies, though it lacked context. A draft for a research paper that had made multiple references to string theory, quantum superposition, and Schrodinger. There was absolutely nothing about the machine that stalked us but maybe it did force a sudden evacuation before anything could be written about it on the sign. And finally, the real find, written in Cyrillic, a technical manual for a full laser tag toy set complete with cross-section of a gun and vest. My hands shook as I held the 30-page booklet that mentioned powerful plutonium batteries and the engine. Because, well, there it was. In our world and reality, some company or governmental organization had created a device that could turn its users into ash. That had happened. Like I said in the email that showed up on the signal intercept story. Damn. The implications. I treated the findings as precious cargo, wrapping them up tightly in my carry-on luggage. The next morning, the three of us got together for breakfast at the bakery, and then Laszlo was nice enough to take us all the way down to Kiev. We said our goodbyes, and he drove off into the proverbial sunset. Me and Jack, though, weren't quite ready to head home. My dosimeter got a bit angry at our clothes, when the soles of our shoes were the worst offenders. Mine especially. I knew it would be best to ditch everything we had worn in the warehouse to keep from setting off any radiological alarms at the airports we'd be passing through. To celebrate being alive, and out of necessity, we both picked up some new nice leather shoes and buried our lightly contaminated duds in a field outside the city. Except for my old pair of shoes, it occurred to me that I needed to have them professionally looked at, thinking that there was a chance that the source of the irradiated material stuck in their bottoms could be traced back to a source even if it couldn't be explained why said material was able to leave the exotic lights of the warehouse. On our last day in the city, I found a freelance chemist of sorts who assured me he'd keep any findings on the down low. And anyway, this was probably one of the few countries in the world where having someone find radioactivity on your person wouldn't instantly raise suspicion that you're illegally handling fissile material. Given that people go on tour in Pripyat all the time, the enthusiast did let me know I could take a while to get the results. Fine by me. I was just looking forward to getting home. After a layover in Lisbon, the two of us got back to the States in the middle of the night, had a parting dinner at the airport, and went our separate ways. I remember thinking about how strange it was that a large, busy airport could exist in the same world as an enclosed artificial town outside a small Ukrainian village. And then... At long last, early in the morning, I arrived at my home in Buffalo, with a few treasures to add to my lockbox. As you know, Tyler, I've been pouring through those documents every night and trying to find leads. I assume you're still going to do the same with the scans I sent you a while ago. And no, I still don't know who built the machine or where it came from. All I can tell you is that it was an efficient hunter built to destroy. God knows who it was originally made to target. 
Now, let me get back to being a vigilant shut-in. Date. 18th of December, 2020. From Tyler to Boris. Freaking hell, Boris. I had no idea it went down like that. I got more questions, but I'll keep them just between us and not post them on the website. I'm still trying to make sense of your experience, but I think I have a good title for the story. That doesn't really give away the surprise of its main villain. How does... The Liminal Warehouse sound? 19th of December, 2020. From Boris to Tyler. Call it whatever you want, Ty. But I guess I'm a little curious about that. I've heard that word before, but never really looked it up or anything. Is it like superluminal because of the lights? Same day, Tyler to Boris. Nah, man. Liminal space. It's kind of like a concept now on the internet. Mostly pictures of places that feel too empty and a little ominous or threatening. Like a long hallway in a dead mall that makes you feel vulnerable as you pass through it. Just google it, you'll see. In that fake town, you getting ready to cross the threshold, as they call it, really fits the title. I'll read the story a few more times, whip up some of my crappy art, get it on the site by the end of the month. 25th of December, 2020. From Boris to Tyler. Hey Ty, happy holidays, merry Christmas, etc. Just wanted to tell you that I'm working on something big over here with a couple of new avenues I've digged up. Can't say anything yet, and it could be a while before it leads up to anything. Gotta ask though, are you planning to put together the recordings our friend made and finish writing the story of what happened to him? I know you wanted to give it some time, but it's been a while now. You said you'd handle it a year ago. Damn, crazy how time goes by. He woke up two years ago today. I know what happened to him isn't exactly a story about lost Cold War history and relics, but if you're going to keep up your creepy past the library, no matter what happens to us, then you might as well work on it. I think it would fit on the website. Same day, reply from Tyler. Alright, fine. You inspired me to finish his story. I guess it'll be the next one that goes up. By the way, I forgot to ask in my last email. Did you ever get the results from the lab test on your shoes? 26th of December, 2020. From Boris to Tyler. Yeah, a couple months later he emailed me his findings. Not that he understood what he was looking at. Probably needed extra time to attempt to verify the composition of the hot material. I'll summarize our discussion. Was the dust from Chernobyl? No, it wasn't. How about any other known nuclear incident? Still no. In fact, it still had signatures of nuclear detonations. We have traces of Neptunium, a rare element that nukes leave behind. So, I figure the Soviets must have run some tests in the area way back. Short of a nuclear war we've all somehow forgotten about, that seemed to be the last and only logical explanation. My chemist had doubts about that. He knew of no nuclear test that would have left concentrated fallout in the area. Want to know what's really strange and unsettling? Soviet and American bombs both leave behind unique mixes of isotopes. A skilled chemist with the knowledge of those signatures would be able to tell what country detonated a bomb long after the fires had gone out. The dust in the warehouse contained an abundance of elements that bombs from both countries would have left behind. Both of them. Indicating a nuclear conflict. Just not one we know about or remember. I can't explain that. Of course... There are many things in that building I can't explain either. Sometimes... I still see its glowing eyes in my dreams. <laughs>